So our next speaker is going to be Jim Dowling. Uh, Jim, is Jim, yeah. So Jim, Jim's coming up. So Jim has become a good friend of mine and uh, we're lucky to have him. Jim has both an MD and a PhD. He is a clinician, he sees patients and he also does uh, in really incredible research. He's a recipient of two of our grants from the foundation. Uh, he is the one that discovered that NAC may help improve endurance in zebrafish. So Jim is uh, really one of the critical uh, people in the world of RYR1, so we're very fortunate to have him here. So Jim, thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mike, for the introduction. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here today. Um, I have, I think, both an enviable and difficult task of introducing everyone to something I think uh, people know a lot about, which is RYR1 myopathies. And my other goal is hopefully to, in some ways, give you a uh, little taster of uh, all the talks that are to come after me. So. Okay. So. I thought it was important just to start off with some definitions so that we're all talking about the same thing. And we're all here because uh, we either have RYR1 myopathy or we have family members or friends that have RYR1 myopathy. Uh, or in my case, we work either clinically or in the laboratory on studying RYR1 myopathy. But what is RYR1 myopathy? I think it's very important that we all think about the terms and what this means. So I'm gonna break it down into its two different parts. So what is RYR1? I think that's the first place to start. Uh, and RYR1 stands for the ryanidine receptor type 1, or the skeletal muscle ryanidine receptor. This is a large gene found on the 19th chromosome. So we all have this gene. We all have two copies of this gene. Uh, it encodes a calcium channel inside the muscle fiber. And this calcium channel is critical for communicating signals from outside the muscle fiber, like a nerve impulse, into muscle contraction. So this is the very means by which, when our brain tells our muscles to move inside the muscle, how the, that signal gets translated into movement. And this is something that Bob Dirksen is going to review in a talk in just a bit. So that's the RYR side. What about myopathy? So what is a myopathy? So in my mind, a myopathy is essentially any condition that impairs function that's caused primarily by a problem with the muscle. So someone who has a myopathy has some element of disability and that is associated or caused by a problem with how the muscle works. So these can be static problems, so weakness that doesn't go away. So someone who's unable to walk because of their myopathy has muscle weakness all the time preventing them from walking. Uh, somebody who has eye movement paralysis has eye movement paralysis all the time that prevents their eyes from moving properly. Those would be static types of muscle weakness and a static form of myopathy. I don't mean by, not, by static by not progressing or not changing, but rather being present all the time. And most patients with RYR1 myopathy have some element of weakness or dysfunction that is present all the time. In addition, patients with myopathy can have dynamic symptoms, things that come and go based on certain triggers or precipitants. I think the most classic example of that is something people are likely familiar with, which is malignant hyperthermia a pharmacogenetic or condition that can only or only occurs in the setting of being exposed to specific anesthetics. So this isn't something that is happening all the time, it's only happening in this one specific setting. So this would be a dynamic symptom. And individuals with RYR1 myopathy or myopathies in general can have static symptoms, dynamic symptoms, or some combination of both. Now, um, I should mention that in a few minutes, uh, Karsten Bonneman is going to be reviewing myopathies in general and providing much more detail uh, related to this concept. And then finally, what is a mutation? Uh, and this is something that Livia Medney is going to be reviewing uh, in quite depth uh, in just a minute. Uh, but I think it's important to mention as well. So in my, my view, uh, mutation is a change in a gene or in the genetic material that alters somehow structure and function and that leads to disease. Um, mutations can come in many, many different varieties, um, and you may have been told that you have a missense mutation or a nonsense mutation or a deletion or a duplication. And it's important to understand that these are all different types of mutation. Um, and also, mutations can come in different inheritance patterns. So you can have mutations that are dominant. You can have mutations that are recessive. You can have mutations that are new or de novo. Um, and this is something, again, that Livia is going to discuss in quite a bit of detail in just a minute. So now that we have a definition, 
who has RYR1 myopathy. So in my feeling, anybody who has myopathy, those signs and symptoms I just described to you, and a mutation in RYR1 has RYR1 myopathy. And this is just two examples of patients I've had the pleasure of meeting over time, one from Michigan and one from Toronto. And in fact, uh, uh, Eli is here in the room and I was given permission to embarrass him uh, with a picture today. So I just wanted to go through just a brief history lesson about RYR1 myopathies because I think it illustrates two things. One is the many different ways in which RYR1 can present, and the other is how much has changed in recent times and how this has really uh, broadened our understanding of RYR1 myopathies. So the first mutation in RYR1 was not found in, in humans, but actually in pigs. These were pigs that were experiencing malignant hypothermia, which is obviously a, was a big problem for the individuals who were raising these pigs. Um, and through a series of very elegant genetic studies done actually at the University of Toronto, just down the road from me, the mutations in RYR1 were identified in this pig uh, group that had malignant hypothermia. Very soon afterwards, the association was made that, I want, uh, the question was asked, well, I wonder if patients who have malignant hypothermia may also have mutations in the same gene. And uh, also in Canada, mutations in RYR1 were found in families with malignant hypothermia. Again, very soon after that, the first patients were identified with uh, central core disease as having RYR1 mutations. And then it was almost 10 years later that uh, recessive mutations in RYR1 were first discovered, initially with a case report of multi-mini-core myopathy uh, being caused by recessive mutation in RYR1. And then a little bit later, the observation that individuals with a subset of mini-core myopathy that cause weakness and eye movement paralysis essentially all had mutations in RYR1. And then really starting in 2010, and this coincides largely with the explosion in genetic and genomic technology, uh, the identification of mutations in RYR1 became very widespread. Uh, first in a condition called centronuclear myopathy, where RYR1 mutations have now been found to be one of the most common causes. Uh, and then in essentially all different histopathologic subtypes of congenital myopathy, so core rod myopathy, nemelin myopathy, um, and central fi or genital fiber type disproportion. And then even further on, all different types of myopathy. So not just what we'd call quote unquote classic congenital myopathy, but individuals who had symptoms such as only exertional uh, muscle breakdown, or only myalgias, or only eye movement paralysis. And, and even more telling, I think, is just two years ago, Carson Bonneman's group described mutations in patients with muscular dystrophy as having mutations in RYR1. So hopefully you can appreciate that in a relatively short period of time, we've gone from basically malignant hypothermia and central core disease as being the things that RYR1 is associated with to this very, very broad group of things um, that it can now be found in. And I thought I would represent it this way uh, because I think it's both important and also a bit confusing. So you can think about things in a gene-based fashion, which is how this conference is really set up, as having RYR1 myopathy. That implies that there is a gene and gene mutation as part of one's myopathy. But quite often we think about myopathies in terms of clinical picture. So maybe I describe myself, or a patient describes himself as having a myopathy, or maybe a muscular dystrophy, or maybe they say that they have exertional uh, symptoms or exertional rhabdomyolysis. So this is another way of describing conditions. And probably even more common, as we heard last night, I think, when families introduce themselves, uh, there's quite a bit of association with muscle biopsy findings. So I have central core disease. I have mini core disease. Um, and the interesting thing, I think, is that you can have all of these things. Um, or you can have just one or some of these things. And I, I think one of the confusions that comes about is, well, if I have RYR1 myopathy, how can I also have central core disease? Um, and if I have... Uh, myopathy, how can I also have malignant hypothermia? So I, hopefully by the end, um, I'll be able to put these spheres together uh, as a way of understanding that, yes, these things can all occur together or they can occur independently. So just to think about the gene base issue for a second. Um, so as is going to be talked about, I think a few different times, there are many, many different mutations in RYR1 that can cause myopathy. These mutations likely have different clinical consequences. Um, it's important to know that some individuals, I'm sure some individuals in the room, have more than one RYR1 mutation, whereas others have only one. Um, and some individuals have the same mutation, but maybe have different clinical presentations. People may have seen this in their family, where one person has 
maybe mild symptoms, but another person has much more severe symptoms, but yet everybody has the same mutation. So this type of variability is very well recognized in RYR1. And even, I think, importantly to understand is that some patients who we suspect have RYR1 mutations have yet to have a mutation found. And maybe that's because they have something different, or they have a mutation in RYR1 in places we haven't looked yet. Um, and that's something that we could talk about further. So just to give you a little highlight about RYR1 mutations, the size of the gene and, and different conditions. So um, this is a map, I think, from 2007 of the known central core disease causing mutations in RYR1. And you can see they're kind of clustering in three different groups. As this map gets updated, it's clear that even for central core disease, there's not necessarily this very specific clustering, though it, it still holds somewhat. The picture gets, I think, more interesting and confusing when you look at the patients who have recessive RYR1 myopathies, uh, where mutations are found essentially in every part of the gene. Um, and so uh, it's important to understand that mutations in RYR1 can occur throughout the whole gene. So this maybe triggers the question, triggers the question in my mind, well, what does it matter what specific mutation that I have? Does this, does this tell me anything about my muscle condition? Um, and the answer is perhaps. <laughs> um, so there is some evidence uh, from our group and others that if you have two mutations, and in particular, if one of the two mutations that you has affects the amount of the RYR that's made, that that can be associated with more severe clinical symptoms than having either two missense mutations or only one missense change alone. Um, there's also some evidence that specific mutations can be associated with specific histopathology or and or specific clinical symptoms. So as I just showed you, for central core disease, there are clustering of mutations associated with central core disease. Um, and we have, I think, the strongest evidence for this with malignant hypothermia. Um, however, we're still quite naive in our understanding of the real association between mutations, the pathology, and I think more importantly, the clinical symptomatology. So for example, for those of you who have RYR myopathy and you have difficulties moving your eyes, this is a relatively common uh, part of the condition, in particular in patients with recessive disease. But is it that specific gene mutations in RYR1 are causing this clinical symptom, or is it just a matter of, of uh, anywhere in the gene? And that's something we don't quite know yet, and something that hopefully, as we gain more information, we'll be able to, to know. And that obviously has very important um, prognostic and uh, disease management uh, implications, because if I can tell you, oh, you have this specific mutation, that means that you are likely to develop this set of symptoms or not these set of symptoms, that can obviously be very important in terms of thinking about care moving forward. So there's also, as mentioned, quite a bit of pathologic heterogeneity. And when I say pathologic, I mean what the muscle looks like under the muscle biopsy. And this is something that Kim Ambergy is gonna be discussing in just a little bit. Uh, and I've listed all the different, or some of them, there's probably even more than this now, all the different types of muscle disease that have been associated with RYR1 mutation. So the classic, again, is central core disease, and uh, though it's clear now that RYR mutations can cause mini core myopathy, centronuclear myopathy, congenital fiber type disproportion, core rod myopathy, myopathy that just kind of looks like myopathy but doesn't have a specific feature, and muscular dystrophy. Um, there are some associations between the location of mutation and the histopathology, as I've mentioned, for central core disease. Um, However, there doesn't seem to be a clear correlation between histopathology per se and clinical picture and clinical presentation. I think that's something important to understand. Um, and I think the other thing to understand, which I'll comment on in just a minute, is that there's also heterogeneity in the genetics of these different findings. And just because you have a specific finding does not necessarily mean that you have an RYR1 mutation. So this is just to emphasize this changing picture of RYR1 pathology. And again, this is something that Kim's going to get into. And I think if I talk about it too much more, she's going to get angry from me taking all of her slides. Uh, and I'm going to skip that because I don't want to. So I, I thought it would be interesting to ask or put forward some questions that I commonly get as a clinician uh, to think about a little bit. So one is, uh, and I've gotten this question from both clinicians uh, and patients, I have an RYR1 mutation. It was not found because I had a muscle biopsy, but because it was done on a gene panel for some other reason, I had clinical symptoms. Um, does it matter what my biopsy looks like? Should I have a biopsy? So I think it's important to understand that in general, um, in neuromuscular medicine, muscle biopsies are used for diagnostics and not for prognostics. Um, and um, 
it's a, so it may not be that what your biopsy looks like has anything to, much to do with what your clinical picture is. Um, also, we don't really understand why specific r y mutations cause specific histopathologic changes. So why is it that one set of recessive mutations causes mini-core myopathy and another set causes centronuclear myopathy? What does that mean? Um, and again, the relationship between biopsy pattern and clinical severity is really not quite understood at this point. Um, and so I would answer that question with saying, I don't quite know if it matters whether you have central core disease. Yes. Uh, I'm just, I don't know what histopathology is. And okay. I don't know if anybody else knows I'm sorry. It's All right. sort of hard to follow. So when I say histopathology, essentially I'm using that term as a surrogate term for what the muscle biopsy looks like. So when someone has a muscle biopsy, the pathologist looks at it, reads it, and then we'll call it, a, we'll, we'll call it based on a specific set of characteristics. So. Yeah, exactly. So, sorry, I went through this too quickly. So these are different stains of the muscle biopsy. And um, so, for example, if you look at, I don't, I can't really, yeah, I, no way I'm leaning that way. All right, I'm going to move away from the micro, boom, for one second. So, if you look over here, this is an oxidative stain of the muscle. And you see that it looks like there's kind of holes in it. So this would be central core disease. And it's described because of that, the appearance of what looks like holes. There's not actually holes in the muscle there's some uh, changes in the way that the structure of the muscle looks like that gives that specific appearance. This over here would be mini core myopathy. You see sort of the smudgy cores, and actually this is more defined on a, a, a deeper look with the microscope using something called electron microscopy. Over here is central nuclear myopathy. I can't, I'm getting at the edge of my bifocal, so I can't actually see the central nuclei but maybe you can see that some of the fibers have a big blue thing in the middle, and that would be centronuclear myopathy. And this is what's called uh, congenital fiber type disproportion. It's a little bit harder to appreciate, but the fibers have been marked based on whether they're slow or fast muscle fibers. And you can see here that the slow muscle fibers are, are very, very small compared to the, the fast muscle fibers. And so this is something called congenital fiber type disproportion. So I apologize. So this is, when I say histopathology, what I'm describing are these specific changes in the names given to them. Okay, um, and again, I'm glad you asked that question because I'm using that term again here. Um, and so this is one thing I wanted to emphasize I just mentioned a few slides ago. So just because you have a specific biopsy pattern does not necessarily mean that you have an RYR1 mutation um, and that these different biopsy patterns are, can be associated with a whole bunch of different types of gene mutations. Um, so for example, if you have been told that you have centronuclear myopathy, you could potentially have a mutation in any one of these genes. However, if an RYR1 gene mutation has already been found, then you have an RYR1 mutation that causes centronuclear myopathy. And so there is this overlap in, in what I would call heterogeneity between the, the biopsy findings and the genes. That's important to understand. So that's sort of the next question that I often get asked um, is, I've been told I have central core disease. Uh, disease. That means I have an RYR1 mutation, right? Uh, and the answer is probably. Uh, and it turns out that if you look at all patients with central core disease, about 90% of them ultimately will have a mutation in the RYR1 gene. Um, however, there are some other genes that can cause central core disease. So for example, MYH7, which is another gene, um, can cause the same pathology, the same muscle biopsy appearance. Um, and so this is just a, a shout and to say the importance of having a specific genetic diagnosis because it helps put the whole picture together. So the last bit of uh, heterogeneity I want to mention is the idea of, of clinical heterogeneity, of the fact that there can be many, many different clinical pictures uh, associated with RYR1 mutation. I think this is something everyone's already experienced from one day at the family meeting uh, and also last night when families were introducing themselves that different individuals with RYR1 mutations have different manifestations. And whether it's weakness that's been present from birth or weakness that just occurred starting in adulthood or no weakness at all, uh, it's important to understand that all these different clinical features come from mutations in RYR1. And as I mentioned a little bit earlier, we don't quite understand why it is that specific mutations cause specific clinical conditions. Um, and this is just one thing, and I think Kim is going to talk a little about this as well, uh, that in general it turns out that recessive, so having two mutations in RYR1, tends to be associated with more severe clinical symptoms than having just one mutation. 
and this is very hard to read because um, it's actually got several different mutations, but over here it shows that patients with recessive RYR next to dominant uh, are more likely to need a feeding tube, for example, when they're young children, um, and over here more likely to need support walking. Okay, so I just mentioned this, so hopefully I've already convinced you you should get genetic testing. If you haven't, I think there's many, many reasons, and if you uh, need more information about those reasons, you can talk to some of the very talented genetic counselors who are here today. Um, but just to list a few of the reasons why one might consider doing genetic testing, uh, and I would just comment that by definition, to have an RYR1 myopathy, one has to have a mutation in RYR1. Um, so, all right. Um, and I, this, I think this comment was made last night at the, fa at the dinner, so I wanted to bring it up. So, okay, you just said that, but I don't have an r one mutation, even though everyone says I have r one myopathy. And my doctors have looked everywhere for your mutation. What does that mean? What should I do? Um, so two things I would recommend at that point would be just to make sure that, uh, that uh, everything has really been looked at um, in the appropriate manner. And I think the list of clinicians that's provided on the RYR1 website uh, is a good reference to start with for this type of question. Um, and secondly, it may be that yes, everything has been looked at, at least that's available now as a clinical test, but there's being research done to uncover uh, novel types of gene mutations. And if you have uh, questions about that, you can uh, ask myself or Dr. Bonneman or Dr. Beggs, all of whom are doing studies looking at uh, new causes of um, unsolved muscle disease. Um, I'm actually going to skip this. We can always go back to that if people have questions because I think I'm, how much more time do I have? Okay. I have one or two minutes, so I'm going to do the most important part in the last one or two minutes. Uh, so, so we've established you have an RYR myopathy. What can we do? Uh, so first I would refer you to the fact that there is a standards of care for congenital myopathies. It's getting a little bit outdated. It's from 2012. Um, but this is a great reference point for you as a family and also for your clinicians to understand the basics uh, of important care for patients with myopathy. Um, this has been uh, made as a family guide as well. Um, and I think, is it linked to on the, the website? Okay. Great. Um, and just a few quick clinical points. Um, so, um, as many of you know, musculoskeletal problems are quite common, scoliosis uh, and skeletal co complications. However, heart involvement is not that common. Um, breathing problems can often be present and often maybe under-recognized, and so it's very important to pay close attention to this, um, and quite often these are only diagnosed through things like sleep studies. Uh, Dr. Meyer is going to be talking about this, I believe, tomorrow morning. Um, this is something that's going to be discussed quite a bit tomorrow, so I'm going to move on since I'm using up extra time. Uh, and then finally, I would just do one mention about uh, treatment possibilities. So secondary, what I call secondary management, has been the mainstay of therapy, so things like physiotherapy, uh, adequate um, and good pulmonary care. Um, as probably people are aware, there are no approved drug treatments at this time. I would mention two things. One is that oral salbutamol has been used in uh, selected cases in, in a case series and shown some potential efficacy for uh, RYR1 myopathy. So it's something to potentially consider and to discuss with your clinician. And the other is mestinon in a certain subset of patients who have features of a condition called my that look like a condition called myasthenia. And then, of course, um, there are many things that are coming down the research pipeline, and these are going to be discussed by the investigators mentioned here. So I know I took a few extra minutes, but thanks. <laughs> Okay, a few questions. What's that? Okay, a few questions. So, so yeah, so we have microphones strategically placed throughout the room. If you have a question, we have about five minutes before our next talk. So, uh, we have some questions. So, just if you can just step up to the microphone, Maraid is. You have to ask questions now on. because I rushed to try to finish in time. So, to, yeah. I'd like to correct you in one of the statements you made. Okay. Excellent. You said MH is just with anesthesia. Our son was told that, we were told that when our son was three and had an episode. If we had been told the truth, he'd be alive today. He died of an awake episode. It's very serious. There's another family here that had a son died of an awake episode. So uh, don't say just anesthesia. Okay, that's an excellent point, and uh, I, I think I would only uh, clarify to say that, that it's a bit of a, uh, that there is some uh, semantical uh, disagreements, in particular among the anesthesia community, 
about whether one can refer to episodes that don't occur with anesthesia as MH, even though the phenomenon, the biologic phenomenon, seems to be extremely similar. I think the important point that I would emphasize is that episodes that can occur outside of MH that involve muscle breakdown and can be very severe um, are common in patients with RYR1 and need to be looked out for. Um, so um, I, I think that, and in, in whether they're called a quote unquote awake MH or whether there's a better terminology for them, I think is a subject at least among clinicians of debate. I, hopefully that's changing. Two studies showed that half of the uh, patients going into the ER with heat stroke, what's described as heat stroke, test positive for MH, which is very significant considering we have such a small percentage of the population. No, I agree, and, and again, a very good point. And, and heat, heat stroke or heat illness is definitely a, a recognized and important uh, feature of RYR, one of the dynamic features of RYR map that needs to be uh, carefully considered and, uh, and uh, appropriately counseled. So. Any other question? When you talk about having different mutations, or you can have many mutations in your RYR1 gene, are you talking about the exons? Yes. Okay, uh, so. so. Yeah, so RYR1, I think, and Livia is going to talk about this a little bit. Um, all genes are broken up into uh, units called exons, and the exons are interspaced by units called introns. And um, most of, or mo essentially all, or most of the mutations that we know about in RYR1 occur in the exons. Um, and often you might be told that uh, my mutation or my child's mutation is uh, in exon 90 or in exon 85 or something. And there's 106 exons in RYR1. So if my son has 21 exons that are affected, that means he has 21 different mutations. Not necessarily. No. So, uh, and this gets it. So, sorry, this is a little confusing. That gets. It, I think I didn't present this in the this most uh, non-confusing fashion. So, there can be many different types of mutations. So, there are mutations that can affect only one of the uh, base pairs, only one of the bit of genetic material, and those can uh, be single changes, and those would occur in one exon. There can also be larger changes, such as deletions or duplications, that can affect multiple exons. And my guess, not knowing the specific genetic report, is if there was something that affected many exons, it was likely either a deletion, so a whole bunch of exons missing, or a duplication, a whole bunch of exons appearing twice. Okay. So those are other mechanisms uh, that can cause mutation, okay. or that you. are mutations that can cause disease. Okay. I think we have One more quick question. Hi, thanks so much for uh, a great presentation. How would you, you recommended getting in touch with a congenital myopathy diagnostic expert. How would one find such a person? So there's a couple different avenues. Uh, one would be uh, the, through the foundation website that lists the, the uh, clinics that would be near you uh, and the individuals listed on those clinics are individuals who are familiar with congenital myopathies and um, likely are up to date in terms of the the, the most recent uh, manners for testing. Uh, if there's ever a question um, that doesn't seem to be answered by uh, someone local, you can email Mike, you can email myself, and I can certainly help uh, find the person who'd be appropriate for you, or else um, individuals like myself or Dr. Bonneman, who's in the back of the room, uh, are always happy to provide a consultation either via email or phone uh, or in person in terms of um, help with diagnostics. Thank you. We get that question all the time, and so that's why we started that, the part of our website. So go to that website. If you're still having questions, just email me, and I can, I can find someone for you. All right. Jim, thanks so much. Really appreciate it.